Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And we're expecting to hear and me, Joy J. Moore, but Joy is unable to be with us. She had a flight delay and our scheduling is such that we're recording this without her, with her permission. So um, I'm sure if Joy were here, she would say Merry Christmas. Yes. Or she would talk about Joy, her name being a great Christmas word. Yes. Uh, but we're going to go on anyway and give us texts from the Tivity of the Lord, which I like to call Christmas Day, uh, December 25th, 2024. And our texts are Isaiah 62, verses 6 through 12, Psalm 97, Titus 3, 4 through 7. And the gospel text is Luke 2, 8 through 20. But you can do 1 through 7 as well if you want. Christmas Eve was uh, pretty much the same text, but only the first part of it. So we're going to refer you to our Christmas Eve podcast, where you and I talk quite a bit about Luke chapter two, but I think there's more to say. So always more we're going to try to focus on the on the second half. There's overlap with that middle paragraph. You get the uh, the angels coming to the shepherds in both articulations. Right, but. right. What do we want to say about Luke 2 that we have not said already? Well, first, I want to say just Merry Christmas to everybody. Oh, yeah. And uh, and maybe people are listening to this. They don't even have to preach. They just, uh, I don't know, want to hear some good news about the text. <laughs> well, we support that. And probably the people who are listening are preachers who have probably are in the midst of working their way through a busy Advent and a busy Christmas, which, yeah, yeah. You know, um, our hard months in ministry because there's a lot to do and there's a lot of goodwill to share and to spread around. And there's a lot of pain in um, families and in congregations and in the world, too. So we're grateful for your preaching, for your work with texts and for letting us into your into your study or into your headphones as you yep. walk around the, the neighborhood. It's our Christmas gift to be able to accompany you all in this. So. Indeed, but I also hope I get more than just that. Me too. <laughs> Although, as you know, uh, my birthday was Christmas Eve, which we acknowledged on the podcast. And of course, the challenge of that is you get the birthday Christmas presents. You too. You too. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's... It's not that I spent double. It's just that I care twice as much with this gift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Anyway. All right. So if we focus on that latter part of 8 through 20, and we really did talk about verse 14 to, um, uh, of goodwill to all or those whom God favors, and the tie to that to chapter 1 and the way in which that is a theme of God's, uh, God's goodwill or God's favor, or God's regard, different words for the lowly and the ones who are marginalized, the ones who uh, we would not see. Uh, so I want to look at verse 15. I, I love that the, the shepherds say to one another, I mean, I don't know, this could have gone so many different <laughs> directions, right? <laughs> I mean, like what the shepherds would have said to each other. Uh, and I don't know, maybe a preacher would want to kind of like think about that. Like, wow, I would have said this, or I would have done this. Would you have gone to Bethlehem? I don't know if I would have gone to Bethlehem, you know. But I love that they say to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. That's just a, a, that is such a poignant moment in this story because they're acknowledging that the Lord has made this thing known to them, uh, not other people, to them, and how unexpected that would have been and how surprising. And uh, they don't just, you know, sit around and think about that. They, they, they do, they, they go to Bethlehem and but particularly, yeah, just which the Lord has made known to us, I, I think just, and and how that can be 
I, I would uh, maybe a Christmas theme. Look at look at what the Lord has made known to us, right? Mm-hmm. Look at how God has God is revealing God's self to us here and now, and inviting people into that that space of of realizing that and recognizing that. Wow, God has God has chosen to <laughs> make this known to us. Yeah, does that make sense. It does make sense. It makes me think that there is. There's not a command given here. They're not told, go tell it on the mountain. They're no. not told, tell everybody you can. What they're told is, to you is born this day. Interesting, to you. Yeah. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child. So I think they are told by the angels, or what they're given is not a command, but an invitation. Yeah. In a sense, come and see. Yeah. If I can borrow that expression from John's gospel. Come and see for yourself. You're invited to come there. Uh, you should go there, in fact, you know, but it's not, it's not a missionary command is my point. Mm -hmm. It's an invitation to wonder and participate Mm -hmm. and they have to decide, uh, should we bring the sheep? Should half of us stay behind? Um, so it's just, it's remarkable that it's like, this is a gift for us tonight. Mm -hmm. When they're done, they glorify God. They praise God just as they've been told for them. It doesn't say they go tell it on the mountain in terms of tell everybody. I'm not making fun of that hymn, but I'm just saying. Oh, I get right? it. Before before the Christian message is go out and do stuff or go out and get busy, the message is come and see what God has done. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, there isn't a command. So they kind of take it upon themselves, right, to, to follow to follow up with this, right. To follow up with what they've heard, uh, which, which in and of itself is, could be a direction that a sermon can take on Christmas. What do you, you know, what are you going to do with this, with this, uh, to you was born this day in the city of David, the savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. Are you going to go see, are you going to, you know, uh, what, yeah. What will you, what, how, what will be your response to that? Uh, right. Will you go look for the sign? Will you point out the sign? Uh, and uh, so it, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a really interesting non-evangelical move or something like, like you said, like come and see. It's not, it's not this, it's not a command. It's really an invitation to response. And I, that can be, that could be a, I think an important message on Christmas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or it is an evangelical move in that evangelical <laughs> means the good news. Come and come and share, right? Come oh. and, and be a part mm-hmm. of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love that you know that shepherds. I these these have to be people who at one time were looking at the stars or you know throwing rocks and talking about David once upon a time. Like, can you believe that like David used to shepherd in these same fields and yeah, you know that kind of you know once what was it like? you know, when that happened, or I heard stories that David, you know, used to go into that cave over there and like take naps when he wasn't supposed to, or when, you know, whatever, whatever, just the, and now here comes this language born to you this day in the city of David, a savior, Mm -hmm. who's the Messiah. There's something there that's, Mm -hmm. that's just beyond the aesthetics of the text and the poetry. That's gotta be exciting for them. Mm Mm-hmm. Bethlehem is no great shakes in the ancient world. This is not an especially big or powerful or proud, noteworthy town. Right. Um, right. as we learned from other parts of the, uh, of the, of the old Testament. Yeah. I think another place I would drop down and I've done a couple of Advent lectionary studies in the last couple of months with folks. And so if they're listening to it, you'll, you'll hear this again, Montana Synod and a couple other places, but, uh, particularly Verse 19, mm-hmm. that Mary pondered these words in her heart. And the word there, ponder, I think we have this like image of Mary just sort of passively, passively sort of thinking and wondering and whatever. But the word is so interesting in Greek. It's soon balo, right? And balo is to throw and soon together. And and so it has this sense of like 
things are being thrown together here that should not be thrown together. And so it's not, it's not this just sort of, Oh, wow, that's really interesting. I mean, she's seeing these things being, including her in all of this thrown into thrown together with good news of great joy and the Lord favoring her and angels in the sky and shepherds. And it's just all these things getting thrown, like I said, thrown together. And so pondering, it has a much more active, uh, I think, sense to it than just sort of contemplating the universe. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. If anybody should have an idea of what's going on, it's Mary. And yet even here, she's what I, what I what what that makes me think of too is Mary's experience up to this point in Luke's gospel has been very private. Mm-hmm. So she has a one on one with Gabriel, and then Elizabeth meets her. It's not clear who else knows anything. Yeah, yeah. About this in yeah. in, in Luke's telling, and if that was me, if I have ever encountered and had dialogue with an angel. <laughs> I would be wondering about my stability or sanity or, you know, is this really real? Yeah. And what are the implications of this for me, for my child? And now all of a sudden you got this group of of shepherds who show up, maybe with sheep in tow, and they're telling a story to you about this host of angels who are singing to them out in the fields. And all of a sudden you probably are realizing, Mary might very well be realizing how public this is about to be. Oh yeah. Or how public Yeah, I like that. Her story might be and certainly her son if she hasn't gotten there already. You know what I mean? All yeah. of a sudden the story is expanding from her relatively private deeply personal encounter with yeah. the divine to now something bigger. Yeah. And that's got to be well it'll get scary later in chapter 2 when Simeon yeah. is like, "Hey, a soul's going to a sword's going to pierce your own soul as well," you know. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. But she's got to be realizing the danger and the hope and the potential in some way. Yeah. And I think that that makes me think, too, that that Sumbalo, right, that pondering doesn't just have to be what's just happened. It's the going back to the Annunciation, right, going back to the angel. So it's all of these things. Yeah. And I think that would be. I think that could be a a meaningful Christmas sermon, right, that we're not just we're not we're not just here for the birth where we've mm-hmm. heard about the miraculous birth of John the Baptist, the, you know, the annunciation, the, uh, the conversation between of course, Elizabeth and Mary and, uh, the Magnificat. And so it, so, uh, so that treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. I mean, it's how she's bringing all of that to bear in this moment as well. Yeah. Yeah. She's on the cusp of something. And we'll see this as well on Sunday's text under the 29th. There'll be a, Mary will keep, continue to be treasuring, pondering Mm -hmm. uh, in her heart. But yeah, what are, on what are we the, what are we on the verge of? What are we on the cusp of? That's a Mm -hmm. good Christmas question. Mm -hmm. And this year, perhaps uh, that's um, a more urgent question in some, in some Mm -hmm. settings than others. Mm -hmm. It is for me. How about that? Yeah. Should we go to Isaiah? Yes. Yeah. Sentinels on the walls of Jerusalem Mm -hmm. who are very, very loud Mm -hmm. (laughs) and they give God no rest. I love that. Yeah. They had a bunch of junior high children (laughs) on recess who have just had a lot of candy and they put them on the walls of Jerusalem (laughs) and they're screaming, reminding God to establish Jerusalem. Well, yeah, and then it it kind of puts a different spin on how you how we imagine the angels in heaven, right? That the uh, sentinels all day and all night they shall never be silent, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the angels are like, okay, come on now, we heard it, we do it, we don't right. need to hear it anymore. But 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 it, yeah, I mean it it does tie into how could you be silent, right? How could you be silent in the news of, of this good news of great joy? Uh, and how does it call us to, I really hear in this a response, right? To Christmas, like, how does it call us? What, what will we not be silent about, uh, when it comes to the good news of Jesus birth? Uh, and where will we choose to 
maybe speak up when other people would say, can you just be quiet now? Um, and we're certainly, the the promises of Christmas need to be, and the promises of of Jesus, or God's favor of the marginalized and God's enter, entry into the world in this unexpected way, we cannot be silent about. I think if you are going to read this text and, and preach on it or refer to it, you need to gloss a few things, especially in verse eight, where there it, it's speaking into the humiliation of people who have had their land raided by a foreign yeah. army and have yeah. stolen their crops so that it, it just read out of context, right? This idea of foreigners drinking the wine for which you have labored. Um, yeah. This is not, this does not need to be at heart a xenophobic text. This is a text about the humiliation of suffering military defeat. Mm -hmm. And so just to help people kind of get a sense for who's talking here and what are they talking mm -hmm. about, I think is mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And the idea, I love the line at the end, right? To, they shall be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. You shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Yeah. Which is just a great name to be called, to be called somebody who's been sought for, somebody who's been mm -hmm. searched for, mm -hmm. a city not forsaken. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know a lot of people who feel forsaken yep. uh, these days or communities that feel that way. and Forgotten, forsaken, overlooked, yeah. not heard. Mm -hmm. a valued and so these are these are promises that need some content and the content i think is the character of god yeah yeah you know? yeah so how we proclaim those needs to be bold without being like scattershot do you know what i mean it needs to be made more specific mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah uh how would you uh how would you use the psalm i, I mean again it, liturgically you know, what liturgically Yes. Yeah. I, I think, again, this is, this is, these praise psalms are wonderful for Christmas because they give content to the praise, which is what I said yeah. last week. Uh, and, uh, but particularly verse 11, light, light dawns for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. You know, just that light dawning on Christmas morning and, uh, and what that light is going to uh, reveal and mean as we move forward in Christmas. But yeah, I mean, hopefully you're doing a lot. I would suspect people are doing a lot of singing that morning. So let's yeah, this shouldn't, your sermon should be shorter than this podcast and Definitely. So time to Just pray. Sing, 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 sing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Or you can preach on Titus chapter three. And more Titus. What would you, yeah. Would you preach on Titus chapter three? Would I? Yeah, I just scrunched up my face. I shouldn't have done that. All of you watching, I'm sorry. Would it wouldn't. <laughs> it would not be my lead text because it would not be mine either. I think you you put Luke two out there, but now Titus will help you figure out what to do with Luke two if you would like to. Mm -hmm. And the idea of a God who saves us not because of anything we've done, but according to God's mercy. And yeah. mercy is not usually a word I associate with Christmas. Uh, I think of joy. I think yeah. of peace. Do you know what I mean? Um, but to, what does it mean to see Christmas as an act of divine mercy? Because we talk yeah. about it as a gift. We talk about it as like an intrusion or a divine presence in the world. I mean, all good images. But it's mm -hmm. also mercy. And I'm coming to the point where uh, some of this is my own work with Matthew's gospel, but in general, I'm just seeing mercy much more prominently in all of the gospels than I have before. In other words, that Jesus is less about disclosing something that we didn't know already and more about enacting something mm -hmm. that when we understand it's God who's the source or the subject of that enactment, it becomes just all the more astonishing how merciful God is. So that mm. that's a longer argument that I shouldn't be making on Christmas Day. But what does it mean to make mercy a Christmas word? Is my that's my question to a preacher. Mm. What does it mean to see the birth of Christ? Not just as a condescension, but as really a way of saying you are included. You are part of this. Well, and and if that were the direction, I would, I mean, not to jump books here, but 
isn't that what Mary saw right, in the Magnificat? I mean, God's mercy is for those who fear God from generation to generation. I mean, she names that what's happening with her is, is a is revealing this characteristic, this essential reality of who God is, that God is about mercy. God does mercy. And how is it that, as you said, how is it that Christmas then is an act of God's mercy, is a revelation of God's mercy, a manifestation of God's mercy? And so how might that and and this, and how might people hear that and experience that word or that understanding of who God is uh, in our in our current times and 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 how does that become then our own sort of sense of where where does Christmas go from here? How is it that we are then uh, agents of angels? I'll say angels, angels of mercy mm-hmm. in the world. Yeah, uh, could be could be a really powerful Christmas message. Indeed. Well, Merry Christmas, first of 12 days of it. Yeah, Merry Christmas to you all. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org brainwave and be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.